Führer und Reichskanzler Adolf Hitler eröffnet die elften Olympischen Spiele 1936 im Olympiastadion. Ich verkünde die Spiele von Berlin zum Feiern der elften Olympiade neuer Zeitrechnung als eröffnet. Hitler seemed sure that he was going to be able to demonstrate Aryan supremacy with a German sweep of the 1936 Olympics. Ah, oh, instead, he was utterly humiliated by an American Negro, a great athlete, Jesse Owens, who won four gold medals. And here they come in the 200-meter final with Jesse Owens, phenomenal star of the American squad, streaking to a new world record around the time and his third Olympic crown, time 21 and 2 tenths seconds. Germany's high spot of the day occurs in an unexpected javelin toss of 235 feet 8 inches by Gerhard Steck, who upsets the mighty Jarvan in the Finland, defending champion. The Meadows of Southern California carries on the traditions of American pole vaulting as he soars to a height of 14 feet 3 inches, a new Olympic mark. Back to the stadium now as the 400 meter women's relay draws to its climax. Watch closely. Germany leads, but a costly mishap is about to occur. They'll drop the baton in the anchor leg, and there it goes! The crowd is stunned. In the meantime, Helen Stevens, the Missouri feminine flyer who holds the ladies' mark for 100 meters, goes bounding down the straightaway to come home out in front. And here in a smashing finale to a thrilling day, the 400-meter relay sees Jesse Owens, leadoff man, blazing the baton trail for the American quartet and picking up a four-yard lead. From Owens, the stick goes to Ralph Metcalf, second lane from the inside. The colored street tears around the clay circuit with the speed of the wind, increasing his lead with every stride. Also running are the sprint entries of Italy, the Netherlands, and Germany. Metcalf passes the stick to Foy Draper. Here you see perhaps the fastest quartet of all time. As Draper goes flying in the lead, Frank Wyckoff is on his toes for the touch off of the anchor leg. And there it is. Wyckoff, now in his third Olympiad, provides a record-breaking climax to America's world supremacy in track and field. The wind is blowing here. It's a little bit chilly. They're set. The gun sounds and they're away. And Jesse Owens from Galilee with Ralph Metcalf. Starts moving. He's a yard or two out in front. Metcalf is coming second up on him. It's Owens, Metcalf, and Ozendorf. Metcalf came in second. Ozendorf. Six boys walked out on the field unnoticed. Unnoticed because a German boy had won an Olympic victory and the crowd was giving him an ovation that was due an Olympic champion. As we sat there on that bench unnoticed, this is the sight that I saw within that wonderful area. As my eyes wandered across the field, I noticed a green grass, a red track with the white lines. And as my eyes wandered into the stands, I noticed 120,000 people sitting and standing within that great area. And as my eyes wandered upward again, I noticed a flag of every nation that was represented there in the Olympic Games underneath that German blue sky. My attention was diverted from that beautiful picture because a whistle had been blown. The starter stepped back about ten paces, and he hollered in a loud German voice, Auf for Pretzel. And when he hollered, Auf for Pretzel, every man went to his mark. Adjusting our hands and our feet, the starter suddenly said in a soft voice, Fertig. And when he hollered, Fertig, every man came to a set position. The boys ran neck and neck for 50 yards. Ralph Metcalf from Marquette University was leading the field the 70-yard mark. And from the 70 to the 90, Ralph and I ran neck and neck. For some unknown reason, I beat Ralph at care for Marquette University in this most historic event. But the greatest honor came as we stood up there on that pedestal of victory. And after we had knelt and received the wreath of victory from the German maidens, and standing our face in the sands, from a faraway distance we could hear the strains of the Star Spangled Banner. As the people in the stands stood, the Germans gave the Nazi salute, the Americans gave the American salute. And as we three on the pedestal of victory did our face, I noticed the stars and stripes were rising higher and higher. And the higher the stars and stripes rose, the louder the strains of the Star Spangled Banner were heard. And then and there I realized my ambition of eight years to become a member of Uncle Sam's Olympic team, to emerge as a victor in the Olympic Games, provided me with my greatest moment throughout my whole athletic career. The 
Fackelträger, der drei Wehrmachtsteile. Und wir machen es auf Tor. Acht der Reihen. Wenn sich die Aschenballer reichen, teilen sie sich in zwei breite, feuerströmende Schlangen, die in schnellem Marsch sind. Nach dem bayerischen Nivelliermarsch nun das Stadion umsäumen werden. Wundervoll wie dieses Feuermeer. Den Platz ummarschiert. Leuchten, leuchten über die Gesichter der 120.000, leuchten bis hinauf zur Regierungsloge. Due to a series of circumstances very much beyond our control, it will not be possible for us to talk to Jesse Owens in London. We got the bad news just before the show began. However, the surprise we had planned for Jesse is still on hand. It's Mrs. Jesse Owens, his wife, who was to have had a part in the transatlantic call. We think you might like to meet Ruth anyway. So here she is, the wife of the world's greatest athlete. <laughs> Ruth, how long have you and Jesse been married? A little more than a year, Mr. Valley. It was one year on July 5th. You haven't forgotten the date, I see. Where did you meet Jesse? At Fairmont Junior High School in Cleveland. We went to school together. You were childhood sweethearts then? Yes, indeed. Do you cook for Jesse? Oh, yes, ever since we were married. Even during training season? Especially during training season. What does he like to eat? Everything, especially steaks, and he actually likes spinach. Mm -hmm. the, the secret of his success, maybe, like Popeye. Do you always watch Jesse when he runs? Every time I can. I missed a few of the college track meets. Well, how did you get word of Jesse's big day in Berlin, Mrs. Owens? I listened to the radio reports. It was a thrilling afternoon, Mr. Valley. I should think it must have been. When does Jesse arrive back home? August 18th, according to present plan. And you're anxious to see him? I certainly am. Mrs. Owens, we wish both of you the best of luck. It's too bad you couldn't talk to your husband over the phone to London, but we're glad that you came anyway. Goodbye, Mr. Valley. Goodbye. If you can take your athletic program Simulate to the home and from which you come and begin to listen to the quarterback of that home as you listen to the quarterback of that ball club. Because your home is very much like a team on which you play. Each member of a team has a position. And each member has the responsibility of executing his responsibility when that play is called. And when the quarterback of that team calls the play, and if you execute your responsibilities at that particular instant when the play is called, the man that's carrying the ball either has a long run or he has a touchdown. Basketball, five men play that game. And you bring the ball down the floor. The captain calls the play, you pass it into the pivot. The man may be cut around or cut across. You get a bounce pass. And that man has the next to execute that play, the responsibility. And when he pounce passes that pass, the man's coming in, he's got a layup and he's got two points. Take our homes from which we come. You have a quarterback, and the quarterback at that home is your mom and dad in that home in which you live. And you are a member of that team. You have a room. You have a responsibility within that room. You have the responsibility of obey thy mother and thy father, and thy days upon this earth shall be longer. Yes, that's your responsibility to listen, to contribute. Dad's responsibility within that home is to provide the economic means to make that home go. The mother, the quarterback in that home, 
is to provide the love, the food, and the household in which you stay. And when they call the play, and if your room and your responsibilities are fulfilled, the father carries out his, mom carries out hers, you don't have a long run or touchdown, but you do have love, understanding, and a feeling of belonging, and a feeling of being wanted upon a team that's going to ensure a very happy home in which you live. Yes, we all have those responsibilities the quality that's going to make it. And it's not easy. I remember so well when I was a child. And I can remember the days when I was about seven years old. I can remember the days when I used to get up at four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning and I was too little to go to the barn to uh, put the equipment on the horses or the mules to go to the field. My brothers would get up and they would put all the equipment on the mules and then they would hitch them to the wagon and then they would come into the household and then we would sit around the breakfast table and my father would give grace that morning. I was seven but I got into the belly of the wagon and that was my responsibility as a member of that team and I had a sack and I picked a hundred pounds of cotton a day I can remember the mornings when it was so wet with dew that as I tried to pull the sack, I could not. And then my father would place me into the wagon again and wait till the sun came out and the dew was dis had disappeared. And then I would get back in the field and pull my end of that responsibility. And I can remember the days as I sat and I watched my mother cry because the family had worked, sold the crops. As a sharecropper on that farm, the man that owned it always said that my dad owed him more. And the question of how you're going to go from here, are you going to strike back and how? And so the days passed. We left Alabama, and then I came into contact with a man that became the person that I wanted to be most like. And that was my junior high school coach. I used to watch him walk the halls, and I used to watch him walk into his office of the gymnasium. And I used to watch him stand before the classes and bark out the orders and the things that we would do to make that gym class, a very interesting one. And I never admired him so much as the time that we had a man that came to our school by the name of Charlie Paddock. And Charlie Paddock at that time was known as the world's fastest human being. And I wanted to be very much like Charlie Paddock. I wanted to make the Olympic team. And then he said to me, I want you to train eight years for next Friday. Next Friday, meaning the Olympic Games. And you set your goal. And then you began to wonder. In this goal in which I set for myself, as I began to move across, there were, yes, there were disappointments, and there were successes. But the one thing that you want to remember, you that leader today in your school, on that road to success you're going to meet, with defeats. But defeats are part of success because if you're never defeated, you never have a full appreciation of what it means to achieve. And they go hand in hand. And that's why you, the person that is chosen today to lead in the school from which you've come, the responsibilities in which you carry with it. We look at athletics, and I know that if it hadn't been for athletics, ladies and gentlemen, I wouldn't be standing here today. I know that. But I also know that athletics is a stepping stone to the things that you wish to achieve. But I warn you of one thing. It is only a part of your life. Every part
particle. What you do becomes a part to make a whole. And don't dwell and don't let athletics become the major part of your life. I want you to know that athletics, yes, is strength. It means coordination. And it means cooperation. But God has a funny way of taking the weakness from the body. And it could come at most any time. And that particular part of your life, yes, you will miss. But you have nine-tenths of another part of your life that you're putting together. And I don't want you to put great emphasis upon the fact that athletics become the greatest thing within your mind. And I don't want you to feel, and I want you to win. I want you to play to win. But if you don't win, the world has not come to an end. Because out of this game in which you play, you learn something. And the men and women that represent the coaching staffs of your institutions of learning, to me, they're teaching you three things. They're going to teach you, first of all, the code of ethics by which to live by. And then they're going to teach you to learn to respect the rights and properties of your fellow man. And then they're going to teach you to play this game of life as well as the game of athletics according to the rules of our society in which we live. The athletic championships, yes, this is one. It's a piece of metal. And if I took these piece of metal, as you take your trophies, and you place it in a place of honor in the institution of learning from which you've come, and oftentimes it's symbolic of a very beautiful banner that you might win. And you'll take that banner and you'll hang it upon the wall in a place of honor. Because this is metal, and if I don't keep it shine, six months from today, it becomes so corroded that I cannot read the year upon which it was won. And that banner that hangs up on the wall that is symbolic of that championship is going to gather so much dust within six months' time, that you cannot read the year upon which it was won. Well, then, what is important? What is important on the road to the success or the championship in which you strive for? That code of ethics by which you're going to learn, the respect and rights of your fellow man, and to learn to play this game of life as well as the game of athletics according to the rules of our society in which we live, and if you can take that from the floor of the field of competition and you put it in the practice in the community in which you live, then to me, you have won the greatest championship that any person can ever win because these are the things that shall never become tarnished. These are the things that shall never gather dust. And these are the things that will live with you as long as you live on the face of God's earth. Prominent athletes from all over the world will have gathered in Berlin, Germany to participate in the impressive ceremonies which will open the ninth edition of the Quadrennial Olympic Games. The nature of those ceremonies will be perhaps familiar to you from the newsreel pictures and the newspaper accounts which you read of the opening of the Olympic Games in Los Angeles, California three years ago. The games there at that time set a new high for this festival. And so Germany's preparations for that impressive event are of worldwide interest. We take you now to Berlin, Germany. System of athletic activity. French, British, and American athletes have just finished a series of contests in England. One American track team is in Stockholm, competing with the athletes of Sweden, Denmark, and Poland. Another group of our boys is in Helsingfors, battling Finland and a team from far away Japan. A third American team is performing in France. This coming week, right here in Berlin, the German championships will be held. And the excitement is only just beginning. This continent is all a quiver with athletic activity. If you could stand with me right now in the concrete gallery of the Olympic Stadium at Berlin, you would realize that great things are soon to happen. Stretched out before us is a vast, partly finished concrete bowl containing a broad expanse of turf surrounded by a 400-meter running track. Forty-one rows of seats extend from its floor to where we are standing. 
Around us are pillars reaching towards the sky to which 31 more rows of seats will soon extend in their ever-widening circle. 2,000 men working in three eight-hour shifts are preparing this setting for the Olympic Games of 1936. Off to the right, looming up over the partly finished stadium is the towering slope of the stand surrounding the swimming pool, now nearly complete. These stands will hold 18,000 spectators. Straight ahead, beyond the far edge of the stadium, is the vast polo field, large enough to contain the Yankee Stadium and the polo grounds in New York, with plenty of parking space around them. Nearby are an equestrian stadium, a hockey stadium, the vast sports forum, which is in reality a college of athletics, a wonderfully compact center for Olympic activity. If we could stand in this same spot one year from today, we would find this great plant vibrant with life. 100,000 spectators will fill the stands to capacity. On the field, hundreds of athletes from dozens of nations will stand in colorful array as a breathless hero, the last of 2,000 relay runners, trucks into the stadium and, with a torch lit on the ancient fields of Olympia in Greece and passed from hand to hand until it has reached Berlin, lights the great flame which will burn over the Olympic Games for 16 days and 16 nights. One year from today is the opening day of the Olympic Games.
if this Olympic Games, the 20th Olympiad, is any criteria of what's going to, what the future is going to be like, then I feel that the future is very bright because it is a spirit here of gaiety, a spirit of uh, understanding, and a spirit of competitive sports that uh, what the Olympic Games is really all about. Every child is giving his best within this Olympic Games. I can see the congratulations of the winners from those whom have been defeated and from the looks of the expressions as I watch the various events, it's one of genuine expression to say, today you are an Olympic champion. Here I began to think in terms of 1936 and make comparisons. Today you don't have the swastaka, you know, the flag. You don't have the brown soldiers. You don't have the goose stepping. Today you have flags of peace. The yellow, the green, the blue that are flourishing all over the city. You have the warm reception of the people as you walk the streets. And as you walk and you get in your car and people stand on the sidewalks and wave. The hordes of people that come to you for their autographs you know, to ask you for to sign their pieces of paper. In 1936, yes, I have shades of it. I think in terms of the number of brown shirts that were shoulder sh to shoulder, I think of those, uh, the Swastaka flags that was, you know, that was flourishing throughout the city. And I think of the quietness of the people and the subduedness and the, and the regimentation of the people at that time. But this is a different Olympiad, the 20th Olympiad, 36 years ago. And the shades of 1936 is not evident here in Munich, Germany. That was the beginning to the end of a very long dream. A dream of wanting to become a member of Uncle Sam's Olympic team, never knowing when. In 1932, as a junior in high school, I was disappointed I didn't make it. And then when I was 13, I thought about it. And that dream persisted until, yet yeah, was the year 1936. And on the way over to the Olympic Games, you had a chance to look back upon your life, look back upon the days of when you really were trying and hoping and praying that this day would come. And I wasn't alone. There were about 362 other athletes in various fields of endeavor that looked and dreamt the same way that I did. And then now I know that the end is near. But I'm looking now to that moment of truth when I'm going to be able to participate in the Olympic Games where we're going to be able to meet the unknown quantity of persons that we had never read about, never seen. And they were there for the same purpose. Because every race that you enter in the Olympic Games, there has to be a winner. And every person that enters those races, be it the preliminaries and get down to the finals, every person in that race in the final is a potential winner. Every person wants to become a winner. And the person that wins it, of course, is given that title that day, being the best in the world in that particular event. So those days and moments of truth were coming. And those are the things that we thought about. Of course, we had as many youngsters out for athletics proportionately then as we do now. But uh, I would say that uh, because of the caliber of athlete that we had in those days, it was tough, it was good. And uh, I would say that, yes, you were challenged at every turn. You believed in it as youngsters believe in today. And you're looking at the kind of equipment that you had that was the best that was available to us at that time. So when I say and I look at records that are being made today. We did create records in those days. 
and records that was just recently broken. But I just say that, yes, uh, if you ask me the question, was the competition as good? And I must say that it was. I heard of Hitler before I got there, but I had never seen him. I saw him every day for seven days. I was running against Hitler. I mean, uh, I didn't go there to run against him, and, and I didn't go there to shake hands with him. Well, that was no problem of mine. I didn't shake hands with him. I didn't go there to shake hands with him. We went to run, and run we did. We had a marvelous time. So sorry that he didn't. And I'm here today. I'm having a marvelous time. And, and really, where he is is no particular concern of mine. So when people say, well, what do you think about Hitler? There is nothing to think about. Thank God. Well, some 15 years ago, in Chicago, in one of the parks called Washington Park. Uh, we did not call it the Arco Jesse Owens Games then, but the idea was born. And it was called a classic. We invited Chicago, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Boston. And we had uh, events that we have changed since then of which I'm very happy that we have made those changes. And we came together at that time with four cities. We wanted to, I was uh, always felt uh, as a competitor, there are a lot of youngsters that sit on the sideline and watch their peers run because they feel that they cannot compete with their peers. So I wanted to do something for that youngster. Now let's take that youngster and let's get others like him. And then we be competitive among them so that they can compete with each other knowing that there are, the other is no better than he. So we went with that idea, the novice youngster bringing him out, giving him an opportunity. And down through the years, these youngsters that sat on the sideline because they felt they could not compete with their peers are the youngster today that did compete at one time, but the youngster that has gone on, many of them have gone on to college with a college scholarship, Many have gone into other fields, the musical world. They did not know they had that talent. But because of that track and field competition, it brought the talent that was hidden within that child. So it's likened like the Olympic Games. It creates a lot of friendships and brotherhood. And then letters flow back and forth across this nation because youngsters have met one another, their own peers, and they find that God created all man, and they're beginning to realize that he's my brother.